Yes, we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Elena Gunyuk, and I'm Regional Director for the Central Eastern Europe at the ESME Banking Club, and I will be your host today. And today we will talk about factoring market, what are the latest changes, and uh, pace of the digitalization in factoring industry. And I'm glad to be joined today for the discussion by Betul Kurtulush, Regional Director for the Central Eastern Europe, South Eastern Europe and Middle East at FCI, and Karol Deszczynski, Factoring Product Manager at Komar. Hello, Betul and Karol, and welcome. Good afternoon. Okay, so before we start, just a short organizational information from my side. So our webinar is uh, scheduled for one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so right after we finish, you will receive the link to the video and the presentations. And today we will have three presentations, and after that we will be ready to answer your questions. So please, you're welcome, and please uh, type your questions into the chat uh, during the presentations. So let's let's go to the topic and let us start uh, from the general overview of the factoring market here in the region uh, and after that discuss the pace of the digitalization in the industry and be tool and passing a microphone to you at once. You're welcome. We do not hear you. We do not hear you, Bitu. Try maybe to restart of mute and unmute again. Mm -mm. Let's do maybe without. We don't hear you. But it was okay on the test, like you changed something, maybe without headphones, maybe without headphones. No. We can't hear you, Bitu. I don't know, maybe let's try to reload page or something. Okay, what about now? Is it okay now? Yes, yes, now we can okay. hear you. Great. Yes, okay. so let us start then. Let me, let me not touch anything. <laughs> uh, still, do you hear me? I need to close. Yes. It. Okay, okay. Then. So, thank you, Olena. Sorry for the uh, voice also behind me because there's a huge construction uh in the area where i am in istanbul we are trying to rebuild this uh, 1600 years old city unfortunately <laughs> there are lots of construction around so i hope it will not disturb the uh, participants so thank you elena for uh inviting me fci uh today and thank you the sme uh, banking club for inviting all of us uh, i know you're organizing many online events uh, I think the contribution of these meetings to our sector is very high. In fact, we spend a long period of time totally uh, sitting at home and uh, meeting online uh, where we could not uh, come together physically and start sharing all uh, the ideas, uh, problems uh, online. Therefore, I strongly uh, believe in the benefits of these uh, online meetings to our day-to-day -day business. Uh, today, I want to talk about the benefits of uh, uh, the, the benefits. Uh, sorry, I want to talk about the statistics of FCI uh, a little bit. Statistics and the, and the what awaits uh, us for the uh, for the coming years. I will start with the uh, statistics. Sorry, I can't hear the screen. Oops. Okay. 
uh, here is the 2020 global statistics on uh, factoring. Uh, the global figure gives a significant indication that the industry had a very challenging year. In line with the uh, damage that uh, 2020 pandemic created globally and all countries impacted uh, differently based on their own uh, specific measures taken by their government and their own response to the crisis. Uh, some reached to the lowest level in the six years uh, reported, while others managed to cope better uh, to the environment. Uh, FCI members, FCI members account for over almost 50 percent of the global factoring volume, of which nearly 80 percent of the uh, represent the world uh, domestic volume and nearly 20 percent of international uh, cross-border factoring volume. Uh, for the period 2017-2019, the factoring uh, industry found an accelerated uh, gear with uh, 9% uh, and 6% and 5% increase respectively. Uh, the growth trend uh, ended uh, suddenly with the pandemic in 2020 as seen as you will see in the uh, following uh, slides. Uh, here it is the global trade figures uh, in 1985 till 2020, trade volumes increased two times. Uh, the rate of global GDP, uh, which is very important since uh, 2012, it has barely kept the pace. Uh, 2019 marked fifth consecutive year uh, for the world merchandise trade stayed below 3% uh, per annum. As you can see here, it changes from more here it is, uh, more upside increase to a, uh, quite a flat uh, increase. You can see here the green dots and comparatively with the, uh, the, the gray dots, comparatively with the uh, green uh, dots, here it is. Uh, <clears throat> the pandemic rock trade performance in uh, 2020, resulting in a negative global economic activity and a higher levels of uncertainty in general. And also supply chains uh, were disrupted due to the impact of the pandemic, uh, coupled with the trend towards the uh, re regionalization, uh, as we call it, delays, increased dilution and delayed payments uh, were the norm in uh, 2020. Uh, here you see the uh, 2020 GDP growth uh, for, the, for the world uh, countries. Uh, GDP global change, you see here, I cannot see, I can see myself. Uh, the GDP uh, global change of real GDP was minus 3.3%. Uh, uh, how countries were uh, affected by the pandemic and when their economies started to recover was directly related to the measures, as I uh, to, uh, said before, taken by their governments. Uh, but it is interesting also that we saw some countries uh, close the year 2020 with a positive growth, even though their economies were not uh, uh, in a good position. Uh, there, there is also some uh, economic crisis in some of the countries, but, th but they are ended with a gro uh, positive growth because of the uh, very timely government supports. Uh, of their, those countries, uh, we can see uh, here as uh, the, some of the positive growth countries, 27 countries saw positive GDP growth in 2020. Uh, this included a cluster of Asian economies such as China, Taiwan, Bangladesh, Vietnam and Turkey. Uh, is, uh, Turkey is one of the very rare countries that with a, a positive growth rate. Uh, for example, in uh, developed uh, European countries, Poland uh, ended up with minus 2.7%. Uh, we see very sharp declines in, in, the, in the euro area, uh, like minus 11% in Spain, minus 8% in um, France, and minus 9.9% here it is in, in the UK. Uh, we better to remember also the difficulties before the pandemic, uh, because we came to pandemic with some other uh, problems, uh, the effects of the uh, trade volume of the uh, countries. We en entered 2020 with the effects of the trade war, uh, fluctuation of the oil prices coming from uh, 2016. 
uh, the effect of the major geopolitical issues and the Brexit, and then we face with the pandemic. So this is the result of this uh, economic uh, developments. So here uh, you see the uh, 2020 global factoring statistics and the market share by the region. Uh, Europe is our uh, biggest market and the oldest market. Uh, the, the growth in sorry, I, see, the growth is uh, in the euro region is uh, the uh, minus growth is uh, seven percent, and North America and, uh, and the gro uh, Europe represent almost eighty percent, seventy percent of the uh, total factoring volume, and uh, we see the North and South America here affected uh, highly with the pandemic. Uh, with the minus 23% in North America and 36% uh, in South America. Uh, Africa, the volume is uh, still very uh, small. Uh, here it is almost 1%, uh, uh, but ended up with a 2.8% uh, increase. Asia Pacific, uh, they faced with the effect of the pandemic before us, and, they, and then the, the recovery come. Uh, uh, before the uh, um, Central Europe, so they ended with the 1.4% increase on the total volume. Middle East, also like Africa, it is very, very small, uh, but uh, the uh, last year figure is minus 4.2%. 4, 4 so at the end, uh, the total volume of 2019, 2.9%, uh, uh, came to uh, 27, uh, 2.9 uh, billion euros, sorry. Uh, ended with the 2.7 uh, billion euros with the uh, decrease of 6.6%. Uh, uh, so you see here the global factoring volume uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, when you see uh, the uh, compound annual growth rate of uh, last 20 years, it, it is uh, 7%. Uh, this is uh, the distribution of the domestic and international business. The blue ones is the domestic turnover growth. Uh, here is the Europe statistics of 2016 uh, till the last, last year. As I told, uh, Europe is our biggest market and oldest and the most developed market, representing around 68% uh, of the total volume, uh, with 1.842 billion euros, shows an overall decline of close to 7%. Uh, from the factoring volume perspective, the top five players, here you see the country names, France uh, minus uh, seven, uh, Germany keep their place. Uh, it's 0. Uh, minus 2, very small decrease. Uh, United Kingdom, 17%. Uh, Italy, 11%. Spain, minus 2%. And overall Europe is uh, minus 7%, which makes up 70% of the total market. And I also would like to add the, uh, here the statistics of the Central Eastern Europe, uh, Southeastern Europe, because it is a region which uh, which uh, emerging and developing countries and mostly their economies are dependent on the, uh, the, those developed countries of the Europe. A uh, vast majority of the countries reported declines in C uh, C region. For example, uh, Poland is one of the biggest uh, market in uh, CE, uh, end up with uh, minus 6.9%. Russia is the second biggest market uh, and uh, there was a, a decrease of 6.3%, Greece 4.1%. Uh, but there are also some positive uh, ex uh, exceptions, like Romania 3.5% increase, Hungary 3.2% increase, Serbia 5.3% increase, and Turkey is another uh, significant player in Europe, showed a very uh, sharp decline uh, from 22 billion to 18 billion, with almost 18% uh, uh, decrease. So here I also already uh, give the uh, uh, data. So here you see the comparison to other uh, forms of trade finance. Uh, first, I would like to explain here, it is the factoring, the general factoring volume. Uh, when you look at the distribution of the domestic and the export business on a uh, company basis, and also we can also say on a country basis, uh, the turnover is all, uh, uh, almost the same, the distribution of domestic uh, turnover is almost uh, 80% and the international is uh, 20%. Uh, coming to the export volume, 
uh, almost half of the turnover coming from the direct finance collection and credit protection. Here it is, you can see. Uh, and the uh, second one is the two-factor collection and uh, credit protection. Uh, coming to the import factoring volume, uh, the biggest share goes to the uh, direct finance uh, with collection and uh, credit protection. And the second biggest uh, portion is the direct finance and collection. Uh, you can see here the domestic volume. Uh, in most of the countries, we say that the domestic uh, turnover is coming from the non-recourse factoring. And second one is the uh, record, uh, recourse factoring uh, without any credit protection. So as a summary of uh, 2020, um, significant growth in the last five years, except uh, 2020, uh, we lost almost nearly... Uh, 200,000 billion uh, turnover in total on the factoring turnover. Uh, factoring so, uh, sector saw uh, regional disparities. America's hit the uh, hardest. Asia uh, was hit hard, but recovery started earlier. Uh, and we witnessed the continuous rise in the fraud and the compliance issues. Uh, and we have a uh, very uh, detailed, very well uh, prepared uh, fraud conference tomorrow uh, and the day after for two days. We are going to discuss the fraud cases because we saw a huge increase in the fraud cases in different parts of the world from the FCI members. We are seeing and witnessing very different fraud cases. We will share the uh, details. Uh, I hope you registered. If not, it is the registration are closed. Uh, but uh, fraud cases is uh, since uh, the beginning of 2020, there was a huge increase in the fraud cases. And credit, uh, credit environment uh, not too adversely impacted due, due in the part of the government support. Uh, however, we see some negative effects on the reduction and withdrawals in credit uh, insurance lines. But I would like to add that uh, we have not encountered as bad, uh, as bad credit uh, rating as the forecasts uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. In fact, uh, the crisis, uh, I think that this, this is not a banking crisis, so we did not encounter this, uh, this scenario as bad as the expectations because before the, uh, the, the beginning of the pandemic, we see the uh, statistics of the bankruptcies like uh, 34%. Uh, up to 50% bankruptcy rate in some countries, but we did not uh, face with that uh, big portion of the uh, bankruptcy cases, uh, so which is uh, quite uh, good. So here you see the uh, global uh, trade uh, history. Uh, this graphic, you see here the 10 years uh, back, uh, what happened in the global trade. Uh, it, it is in 2015, in 2016 uh, also was very difficult years. Maybe you uh, all, all know, uh, may remember. Uh, commodities prices collapsed, oil prices uh, declined very sharply. Uh, a slowdown in uh, China's economy, maybe a recession also, they never called this, this a recession, but it was a, almost a recession. And we ca come to 2000. Uh, 19, the trade war uh, also creates collapse uh, and COVID came in. So it is, uh, you see on the global trade, uh, there was, since the 10 years back, there are lots of uh, effects uh, on the uh, decreasing effects of the global trade. But the expectation, you see here, the expectation for this year and the next year, uh, the expected, the estimates is close to, uh, close to almost uh, 5%. Uh, so factoring in recession times, uh, this is the statistics of uh, what we are uh, in our hand, the FCI statistics. Uh, <clears throat> we have the statistics of uh, two uh, uh, depression and recession, the, the Great Depression in 1930s and the Great Recession in 2008-2009 uh, period. Uh, in T 10 years time after the Great Depression, the U.S. factoring industry grew by 13%. And again, after the 2008-2009 crisis, the world factoring volume increased by two times in two years' time and three times in three years' time. So uh, so the figure uh, at the, in 2010, uh, volume reached uh, almost uh, uh, 3 trillion euro. 
Uh, so the story here is that the factoring is performing very good in recession uh, periods, just like we are uh, seeing now. Uh, here is, uh, we see the predictions uh, in the post-COVID world. Uh, so, of course, there are lots of uh, items that we can talk about, but it is, we, time is not uh, allow us to discuss everything. So I would like to uh, mention a few of them. Uh, the first uh, is the number one. Uh, what happens in uh, crisis times? Uh, commercial banks pull the credit lines of the SMEs. It is a fact, it is a repeated fact that they are becoming more conservative and this is why the factoring steps in. Uh, so the uh, turnover is increases. Uh, the factoring is steps in because of the strong operational control of factoring, the control over the sellers, the control over the buyers, uh, and also protect the dilution risk. And uh, so, so factoring is support the real economy. It is not uh, just because of the bank uh, pull the credit lines. Uh, also, the factoring is supports the real economy and supports of the uh, liquidity of the uh, of the SMEs, especially uh, because of this. Uh, uh, after COVID period, all the corporates, especially for the SMEs, they are looking for the uh, alternative source of liquidity. And the second one is uh, the liquidity. Of course, liquidity is uh, not be as abundant as before, not only for the SMEs and for the non-bank financial institutions. So I believe that uh, this year also, and maybe the next year, liquidity will be an issue. Uh, so the third, uh, what uh, we are seeing in the uh, market, uh, the, uh, the rise on the fintechs and the digitalization. Uh, during the pandemic, the contactless transactions have become uh, the primary focus. Uh, of course, with the uh, remote working conditions, uh, there are many solutions for uh, document management, uh, digital scanning, OCR technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning based solutions. The opportunities are sizable if you consider the uh, digital document processing advancement, roboting processing automations, uh, trade document preparations. Uh, so there are lots of uh, solutions, e-solutions for uh, signing documents electronically. I think we will talk uh, uh, deeply today with the, with the presentation and during the question and answer session for this new development on the digitalization. And here it is the expectation for the GDP, for, uh, for the uh the, the 2021 uh this is very interesting because the gdp expectation for uh for example for us united states is six uh, percent uh, the growth uh, expectation is six percent uh, for this year uh, at least it is a four percent uh, faster than the uh, pre-pandemic year and you can see the the expectation for the for the other countries france is uh, almost also six percent uh, UK 5.5, and it is all uh, bigger than 3.4%. Uh, so the expectations are uh, like uh, the economies are booming. Uh, uh, when you look at the history, it has not happened since the post-war boom in the 1950s. So the situation is quite unfamiliar. Uh, so the economies are turning into the history uh, to, for a sense that what to expect in the financial world uh, and for our business. Uh, the record suggests that the afterpiece of a massive uh, non-financial disruption, such as wars or uh, pandemics, uh, GDP does bounce back. So the expectation on the GDPs are booming. I hope the our industry uh, will benefit from this uh, increase. Uh, and the history uh, and the economies are offer uh, three further lessons from this booming. Uh, first one, while people are keen to go out and spend uh, more, uh, uncertainty, of course, lingers. The second one, uh, crisis encourage people and business try to new ways of doing uh, things, uh, such as uh, after the crisis and pandemic uh, periods, uh, the startup uh, booming and the digital solutions are booming. Thirds, 
uh, as uh, Le Miserable shows uh, political upheaval uh, often follows with unpredictable economic consequences, but this is not, of course, our uh, focus today. Uh, so the economists have drawn a link between the pandemic and another change to the supply side of the economy. The use of labor-saving technology, what I understand from the labor-saving technology, uh, it is a digitalization, so doing things more digital uh, without uh, uh, paying more labor. Uh, so digitalization is our in our life, uh, and it's going to be more and more in our life. Uh, what I see in, uh, on a uh, not uh, company basis, on also the uh, country basis from the uh, regulation side, there are lots of uh, development uh, for the digital solutions, for the e-solutions. Uh, for example, in Poland, there are very good uh, e-solutions, e-invoices, e-solutions for uh, uh, <clears throat> speed up or operational periods. Uh, what I'm seeing in different countries, there are lots of uh, recording system, e-recording systems uh, on a governmental level because governments also need to uh, update themselves for this digital, digital development. It is not a uh, necessary, it is, uh, it is a must for them to uh, catch the, the digital, digital world, uh, digital developments. Uh, for example, we are seeing very good uh, recording solutions in Turkey, receivable recording center. Uh, in Italy, uh, there's a very good uh, uh, receivable recording center for uh, government uh, receivables. Uh, for example, in Romania, we see a very good uh, solution for on a, uh, a movable assets. In UIA, there is a very good solution work on the blockchain uh, basis for the receivable recording for invoice uh, receivable recording. And uh, so it is <clears throat> uh, the use of uh, technology uh, helps to deal also potential trades and lower the cost of our transactions. So it is very important for day to day lives. Uh, in this regard, what I see that the software companies and the technology companies need to be very close to their clients uh, to have the agile relationship. Uh, the main concern of the companies and also for the countries is how to choose the right technology. It is not easy to choose the, which technology we, we will benefit for, the, for our business. Uh, the FI resources, uh, the bank's resources, financial institution resources uh, are limited and the cost of the project, project management and the software references are the most important items uh, because the long investment of uh, software or digital solutions can be easily turned into a never-ending story of an increasing quote, which is the very main responsibility of the uh, of the professionals. Uh, so this is the end of my uh, presentation. I think we will uh, speak about the different uh, digital solutions on different countries uh, today during the question and answer sessions. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Butu, for the for so insightful presentation. Many many important questions actually are raised here, and I suggest, for example, one of them regarding fraud. Uh, um, this is a you know a really very important question. So let us discuss uh, during the um, Q and A session. So what are the te uh, technologies uh, allowing to mitigate this? And now I will shortly share with you. Um, what is the situation in the Central Eastern Europe with the digital, digitalization of the factoring um, services and uh, for micros and SMEs? This is the, the segment we are, uh, we are focusing here. And yes, Betul, as you mentioned, this uh, crisis times are the other times when, uh, um, especially for micros and SMEs, this access to the finance is becoming a bit limited and uh, moving towards this asset based finance which is which factoring is let's call it uh, let's call it like this so we do um at sme banking club we do an annual research on the digital uh, uh, factoring solutions available for sme customers and i will now uh, share shortly what are the results so here i would like to show you now the slides that um the market is divided. So this is a slide from the from the snapshot from the Polish market, but it can be translated for the 
whole Central Eastern Europe region that many factoring, traditional factoring companies and, and banks are servicing with factoring clutch corporations and also upper SMEs. And this is their focus uh, at the moment. And, um, uh, and the micros and these lower SMEs, these are really, um, they are covered really by um, maybe five companies in the region. Uh, and actually this, these are these digital solutions here. And uh, this market is um, evaluated by the players themselves, meaning uh, factoring fintechs, as 1% of the market. So only around 1% of the market uh, are factoring a digital factoring. So the rest is a traditional one. And of course, this is explained that these um, digitalized solutions are mainly targeted for micros and SMEs which makes sense for the segment because, of course, having um, manual or semi-manual procedures, which can be profitable still for large corporate or maybe mid-market customers, but they will not be profitable for the SMEs. Uh, and that's why uh, in a lot of markets, this segment is not covered by, this, by, the, by the factoring services. So, uh, if to go and see in more details, so actually from the around 75 uh, players here on the Central Eastern Europe market, uh, 13 companies have online application for factoring services and eight companies uh, uh, have fully digital process for factoring. So we call it, uh, we, and we see that this is actually the beginning of the digitalization uh, uh, at, the, at this market in this industry. So if we see uh, on the market, so Poland has the biggest number of each. So these are represented by three banks and four um, factoring fintechs. In Romania, uh, one bank uh, is offering, uh, so only online application is available and two companies, uh, uh, factoring companies offering digital uh, process for SMEs. And actually this year is an interesting example that TBI Bank uh, in Romania launched uh, factoring for customers with the cooperation of a fintech called Instant Factoring, which is a good case and good example of the cooperation between banks and, and, and fintechs. Mm. And uh, uh, one example from, from Latvia, two examples from Turkey, where banks are um, uh, providing only online application, but now, uh, so we update this study every September. So on September, we will have uh, updated results. And now we see uh, several new players are coming to this digital, uh, digital market, but still there are like uh, two, three new companies, which we see now on the market compared to the previous year. So uh, this is, as I said, so this is the start of the digitalization uh, in this region and the main product just to maybe describe what is it offered in the digital process for SMEs and micros. This is domestic factoring, mainly in loan, um, in local currency, but also in, uh, in Euro, for example, but only for domestic counterparties or mainly for domestic counterparties. This is recourse factoring, maximum 90 days and um, with uh, minimum amount 50 euro up to 5,000 euro uh, for one invoice and available. So time to cash, meaning the decision and the financing of the invoice starts from five minutes here. So this is uh, what I uh, would like you to show uh, as, a, as an example and what is the situation at this uh, very moment uh, uh, in the region. Um, okay, yes, we have, we see here the comment that tap factoring has online application uh, via mobile app and website. Okay, maybe this is uh, changed uh, uh, because, I mean, when we do this study, we, this is the first step that we check the bank's websites and factoring company websites. So if we can uh, quickly find this online application on the bank's website, then we consider that this is an, uh, an advantage of the bank or for a factoring company and that the customer can easily find it and, and, and fulfill and send the application. Uh, so we will, we will be gladly, you know, uh, add the factoring here uh, in updated version in September. Uh, yes, this is reverse, this is uh, reverse factoring, right. 
Uh, okay, so I uh, uh, I'm passing now a word and a microphone, Carol, to you. So to share with us how actually uh, banks and factoring companies can digitalize uh, their factoring processes. Let's okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here again, Elena. Thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to start with with uh, the architecture. So uh, let's this one. So <clears throat> uh, there are many advantages of the modern ar architecture that help to digitize the process right now. Uh, first of all, scalability. Uh, the companies that are experiencing uh, high levels of growth um, should consider investing in, for example, cloud-based uh, uh, services because the scalability of the cloud uh, gives growing business the flexibility to expand their bandwidth and capacity on, on demand. Uh, similarly, uh, if a company is expressing, for example, a period of decline, uh, which shows during the, the pandemic, uh, it can scale down. Uh, so as a result, um, companies can adapt to change in real time. And when it comes to capacity concerns, uh, cloud can meet your needs and take expensive uh, hardware uh, out of the equation. The second uh, thing is security. And this is one of the important factors in any business, the security of data. And one of the biggest threats right now in, of the data security is the theft of the employee laptops. And likely uh, with the capabilities of the cloud, the loss of a laptop or a machine does not have to mean the loss of the data because the data stored in the cloud can be easily uh, recovered uh, on any device. And I think what is more important, uh, it can be whipped from any stolen device. A device. So please remember that uh, the, on the cloud model, the vendor uh, takes the care of the security issue. Uh, microservices are also very big advantages. Uh, for example, a factoric system can have different modules, uh, repayment module, contract module, administration module, et cetera. And thanks to uh, microservices, each of those modules as, as a separate, act as a separate uh, entity. And of course, these modules uh, work together, they cooperate. But if, the, if you want to add some improvements, some features to the selected model, it will not affect um, operation on other modules or entire system. So developers can work on separate microservices, uh, for example, upload patches or improvements without affecting the system. In other words, thanks to microservices, uh, the system is no longer one big monolith, which was a common situation until a few years uh, ago. Also very important is cost optimization. Uh, managing things like bandwidth, hardware, application improvement um, can be predicament. So please remember that with the cloud system, all of those uh, responsibilities uh, rest with the provider. And this effectively, effectively uh, reduce the uh, capital spending right from the start. So there are little to no initial investments at the beginning. Uh, I think it's also uh, very important to to see that the, in the, which environment do you do you work. If you a company that looking for a cloud solutions is operating in a dynamic envir environment, uh, I think it couldn't have been better. Uh, such market is undoubtedly the um, financial market where not only constantly changing uh, financial regulations, such as, for example, a few years ago, split payment or whitelist require rapid implementations, but also constant need to improve your system um, of sharing technological in, uh, innovations, user experience, et cetera, fixes, for example. Uh, the cloud environment now enables ongoing systems updates and keeping up with continuous uh, changes which are very, uh, the, that are very important in the digitalization process. This is also also important feature uh, and thing is uh, who will use the system. Because uh, wherever the advantage of the cloud is the continuous improvement, uploading patches to the system, uh, et cetera, for example, a system 
for airlines where operation operators manage a thousand of aircraft and lives of hundreds of thousands of people so such weekly changes to the system i'm not sure they are entirely welcome uh, because these changes uh, usually requires uh, things like uh, s uh, staff training uh, instruction etc so in this case such changes in my opinion should should take place less frequently um, pay as you grow model this is also very interesting thing and an advantage of this pricing model that the uh, recipient of the system uh, pays less for the service uh, and over the time if his business, their business started to spin, he will acquire new customers and who will report more and more invoices for financings. Then uh, they, he will, uh, he will incur uh, higher costs. So thanks to the flexible approach, the customer can uh, devote uh, more resources to marketing activities or even to the uh, development to the to the sales team mm, this is something like a su uh, subscribe subscription for factoring and it's becoming more and more popular i think it's something like the netflix pla platform only a little bit more expensive uh, factoring factoring over the years mm, i think i think that uh, this picture so shows exactly that not so long ago factors work and uh, work how a factor worked and what's more some of them still works today most credit or factoring processes are based uh, on or have recently relied on paper documentation and it's it was very time consuming to request for example a contract or add a counterparty or contractor to the factoring limit or increase the the factoring limit everything was on paper uh, but however um, banks uh, or factors must uh, must remember that the next generation that is coming into the market uh, the younger the younger generation especially is more and more demanding demanding so getting rid of the paper and moving it online is a necessity right now because fewer in the future in my opinion fewer and fewer customers want to go to the to the bank to sign a loan or or other contract everything must be must be online to be honest uh, online onboarding mm, when we think about this uh, why we should go to the bank at all uh, modern modern solutions allows uh, you to care allow you to carry out the onboarding process without a uh, need to leave the house the identity of the client can be verified uh, through the camera and the laptop phone or even through the voice uh, for example, another way um, to, to, to identify, identify the client is uh, making a transfer, for example, one euro to confirm the user that to be sure the person competing for the, um, completing the online application uh, is actual uh, account holder. And other thing, the checking the customer and the contractors in credit dat databases, for example, with cooperation with insurers or blacklist, right now takes a few few seconds without having uh, to archive all of them on the paper, uh, all connecting to the databases via via API, for example, and all this leads us to the decision uh, to grant a factoring limit in less than 10 seconds less than 10 seconds which uh, a few years ago, ago was impossible because the processes in bank lasted for example two three or even more weeks yeah so right now it is possible to have a factoring decision in 10 10 seconds less than 10 seconds of course uh, all knockout criteria um, must be met for such a decision to to be made automatically uh, but even so, if some knockouts appears and the decision goes to the traditional uh, traditional uh, process, um, it will likely it will likely take uh, uh, no more than than my, than one day. So the the gap uh, right now is is very huge. Uh, OCR, I think the invoice uploading, uh, loading invoices into the factoring system. 
is also easier than ever because OCR, QR code, out and out, I think Betus mentioned that are now uh, becoming the standard. All you need is to take a photo of the invoice uh, and the system will fill all the required uh, fields, yes? Uh, also, large amount of invoices are not a problem anymore because the largest file I have ever seen uh, had 20,000 invoices and the system purchased all the invoices in just an, over an hour. So 20,000 invoices in one hour. I think this is astonishing and, and it's, it's very, very uh, good right now and very fast right now. Uh, also, manual uh, uh, checkout is now easier uh, because you need to fill in, in nowadays factoring system about three or four fields right now, uh, like uh, invoice number, payment date, and, and invoice amount, for example, and, and everything is okay. Yeah? And invoices directly from ERP. This is the other case, but I will tell it a bit, a little bit more about it in a few minutes. Uh, I think also user experience is something that that uh, helps to, to digitize the process. Uh, we must remember that people using the system are both end customers and uh, that usually have factoring agreement with factor or the bank and employees of the uh, of the factor back office employees yes and customers expect the system to be as transparent as as intuitive uh, institutive sorry uh, as possible to and to other access uh, for example as computer uh, mobile phone etc yeah? and on the other side uh, there are factor employees who need a very powerful tool to handle factoring agreements, settlements, etc. And right now, um, good factoring system should allow, for example, should allow, for example, to submit invoices from many places from the system. Should provide transparent reports, etc. But in my opinion, the most important thing is one thing that factoring system shouldn't have. It shouldn't have a user manual because if the client is not able to intuitively navigate through the system, it means that the system, in my opinion, is poorly prepared. So if the system has a user manual, I'm not sure that's a good system right now. And uh next slide what about the what about the back uh, office i think you all know this gentleman here uh, the clients do not come first employee come first yes take care of your employees and they will take care of the the client and of course we didn't forget about the back office improvement i think in this case improvement uh, payment matching improvement uh, uh, is is very important payment reco uh, reconciliation in many factoring system has accuracy for about 50, 60 persons. So I think uh, you need to just imagine how much of hard work the back office employees need to need to do. Another uh, another thing is good notifications because uh, uh, they also improve fasten uh, improve and fasten the work of employees. Uh, simplified contract management, such as introduction of the annexes through the uh, uh, QR code of OCR is also the answer for this. And of course, uh, task uh, or to-do list is, is very important uh, uh, factor for factoring uh, back office employee. As you will see here, after logging the, the Victoria here sees everything she, she needs to do uh, uh, through the through the system uh, right now and i think that uh, the system we need to ensure the having a simple and transparent clean journey the system uh, that we built was built together with end customer and each subsequent module was uh, previously properly tested and uh, uploaded to production after this this focus uh, uh, with the clients so it's also worth to mention that the feedback that, that we obtained was 97 97 percent positive so so this this result was astonishing for us and we are glad to we can show it uh, what we what we uh, didn't forget is of course the back office employees and thanks to the automation uh, they can 
devote their time, for example, to other things such as um, customer after sales service, for example, because there uh, there is a quote I like to to share. If you do not call, if you're not calling your uh, calling your client, other factor or bank is calling them. So so I think the after sales service is also very very important right now, uh, especially during the uh, post post COVID post -pand pandemic uh, times. ERP integration. Mm. The next step, in my opinion, is also the connection with the ERP system. As I mentioned at the, the beginning, um, customers are more and more demanding, especially the, the younger, younger uh, people. They have an ERP system in which, in which they can, for example, manage their accounting. So why can't they also manage their finances there? Um, and I think, um, I think this is the new way where the invoices where the invoices for example as you can see here uh, uh, can be finances from finances from directed from irp and they will have also the bigger choice of the product uh, i i think it's it's called uh, uh, one shop stop so every product every product in one uh, one place uh, as you can see here uh, as you can see here for example with Comar finance connected with connection with VRP, the clients are uh, able to have for example factoring agreement debt collection agreement uh, leasing operations uh, foreign exchange guarantees letter of collections etc and etc so i think this also uh, it's also the the future of, of uh, factoring and uh, and banking fintechs versus bank can they uh, complement each other uh, i think yes uh, but the fintechs are some kind of uh, indicators uh, indicators uh, of the directions uh, to the traditional bank um, that they will choose in the future for example, fintechs also serve the smallest customers, micro customers. I mean, think Olena mentioned that from whom, from whom right now banks do, do not have a ready-made and fast, fast process. Uh, the fintechs also play an additional role that I think at the beginning was not fully planned because they they educate the client, the smallest client, the micro clients, uh, and most importantly they allow them to spread the wings so thanks to financing and the initial stage of the operation the, the micro companies can increase the turnover uh, and they eventually become a tasty morsel for banks yes because they will grow and uh, eventually they will go to the banks so it is possible that the next step will be also the cooperation between fintechs and the banks uh, and uh, mutual benefits in the uh, service of the clients who naturally at the certain stage of the company development uh, will uh, need further strict banking products as, as i mentioned before so so i think the cooperation is possible and it will be uh, more and more uh, uh, on the market uh, in in next maybe months maybe years and that's that's all for my for my presentation so thank you. Thank you, Carol. Here's let us thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Let me invite also B tool back and let us start the, the Q and A session because I see uh, we have a lot of uh, questions and, and comments here. So let me let me start from the from the very first. So first of all, I would like to thank you uh, all here the participants that are. Um, writing about new solutions appearing right now for the digital factoring. This is great. Uh, I'm really glad to, to read this and uh, we will add you into the into the study and also we do annual ranking of the digital factoring available here in Central Eastern Europe. So we will check your digital processes and, uh, and we'll gladly add you uh, to in, in the updated study in September. So I saw here the question that uh, factoring invoice value from uh, Sergey. 
So factoring in was value ranged uh, if up to fifty thousand dollar is a bit small as for invoices up to one hundred thousand. What the solution can be? Well, this um, the, the numbers that I showed. This was like the average uh, um, invoices that uh, factoring companies are financing. Uh, uh, I mean, per one invoice. While for the limits, this I mean, number of one hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars euros. It, it even can be higher for SMEs. So this is um, this is a usual case that the limit a uh, factoring limit, let's say, or uh, limit of factoring finance is set for the customer, which can be even more than 100,000 uh, euro, and the customer can finance the invoicing within this within this limit. So, uh, and usually within such limit, this is still considered other micro and SME, depending on the um, segmentations that banks or factoring companies has have, and um, it usually goes. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if there is a digital process, it usually goes to the digital process. If uh, uh, company are uh, um, doing this with a manual process, so then there is available with a manual process. But it also, you know, the, the, the question of your risk appetite, probably, I mean, because this is also the risk of the counterparty if, uh, to finance, for example, amount of one invoice. So, um, in general, if you talk about SME finance, uh, both factoring and lending, so up to what we see here on the market is like up to 100,000 or a bit more. This is mainly uh, automatic uh, decisions. Uh, when it is high, it could be a mixed one, like um, scoring decision with some uh, human, let's say, check checks. And uh, if it is a Corporate customer, of course, this is mainly uh, mainly um, human uh, underwriters are, are doing the analysis, etc. So, uh, can invoices uh, yes to machine learning uh, based algorithm? Yes, okay. Um, yes, few words about ML and QIC requirements, uh, quite challenging at digital factoring, requires some traditional steps, however. Yes, actually, I would like to get back to this question, which Bitul, you mentioned regarding the, also the fraud uh, detection. Uh, and, and only let us maybe also put here this early warning uh, signals. So uh, the, there is, uh, um, um, I mean, part of the companies uh, think that this manual check-ins are better than the digital one or automated one. So, Carla, maybe you could comment here. What are actually the technologies available here and how this can be done uh, effectively in an automatic way? Uh, I think the early warning uh, system or the, about the question about the early warning system is very good right now be, because as factoring itself brings uh, many additional bef benefits, uh, which in era of uncertainty, uh, the pandemic era may help to catch irregularities appearing in a given contract. Uh, for example, uh, early warning systems can monitor contract behavior on an ongoing basis. And as an example, uh, it can be catching delays uh, in payments from individual, uh, individual contractors. So, for example, if the average payment delay increases from 5 to 10 days, the contract, uh, the contract operator uh, can receive uh, a warning signal. Of course, it does, does not have to be an indicator that cooperation with uh, this contractor should be uh, terminated or something, but it only indicates that the contractor is worth having a closer look at. This is to prevent the situation into which the funds to be returned to the buyer or goods will never never reach the seller, factor or, or, or the bank. Yes. And I think it's also to mention because I'm not I don't want to, to think about the early warning system about uh, froze only. Yes. I think it's also worth to mention uh, I like to call it the early warning retention. This is the information that the factors on bank uh, or banks can also use to avoid a customer living for another financial institution. Uh, here, for example, the system can catch uh, a decreased activity on a contract. Uh, of course, it also doesn't have to mean that company is ready to change the provider of factoring uh, uh, or banking services. 
because there are a lot of our seasonal companies on the market yes but uh, which uh, uh, however such information may come uh, may come handy in difficult uh, times because it's very easy to lose the clients but it's more uh, more difficult to gain a new customer for, for example, for factoring services. So I think also that information, because maybe the operator can call this this client and ask about some problems. Maybe the price is too big, and the other uh, bank or factor came up with with lower prices. So this is the signal that also, in my opinion, can uh, can help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, what about maybe a bit more about fraud uh, detection? Mm -hmm. In this case, I think this this system can can also catch some anomalies on the contract. Like, for example, if the clients mm, purchase an invoices of average amount, for example, 100 to 1,000 uh, euros, for example, and suddenly uh, there is a, a invoice for 1 million euro. So this is for me an anomaly. Yes, and for example, like they uh, they are having uh, average on average. Uh, 30 invoices every month and suddenly they gave 100 to 200 invoices it's also a warning signal for me yes and and uh, maybe the the business grows and that's okay but i think the operator uh, should should have a closer look at this at this client in my opinion mm -hmm. Yes, I. Um, we talked. Uh, if to maybe give some interesting fact, maybe here. Uh, last year, we um, we talked to one of the fintechs here in Poland, factoring fintechs, and what was interesting for me, for example, that one of the knockout criteria which they could um, or, or are able actually to detect. Uh, automatically uh, uh, using uh, everything like access to to the data, the machine learning, and everything. But also, the interesting thing for, for me was that they can check whether the invoice was issued in, in one location, meaning kind of one building or one office. So if this was issued in the same office and sent to the customer to pay in the same office, so this is a knockout criteria, and they, for example, do not find such invoice, and they can detect it in seconds. So this for me was a very interesting case, which really you cannot check such cases manually because how? But, yes, but, yeah. but this is the, the, I think, most common fraud, one of the most common frauds in factoring because there is mm -hmm. connection between the company and the contractor. Yes, they will always yeah. confirm the invoice, everything yeah. will be always okay, et cetera. Yes, so I think that's that's very important issue that you mentioned, Elena. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, no, I yes, yes. Something, uh, Carol. Of course, the, all the uh, uh, the examples and the uh, digital developments is very important for for the detecting the, the fraud. Uh, so, of course, there is a difference uh, difference uh, between an emos being uh, processed manually versus that process digitally through the platform which instantly and accurately check and validate it and those plus, uh, platform constantly uh, controls uh, many predefined parameters uh, such as compliance uh, they are asking some questions about the kyc or blacklist or some others as a result of the machine learning these platforms are constantly learning improving develop efficiencies get better with time but on the other side uh, the fraud cases is also uh, learning the frauds how to the how to uh, organize the organize the frauds depending of of these machine learned systems. So it is uh, goes hand in hand. So it is not easy for for all of us. Even we are using the uh, machine learned technologies. Uh, the fraud organizers are uh, learning the same right. <laughs> as we are uh, dealing with yeah. the uh, uh, preventing fraud. So uh, what I see from uh, the different examples, the, uh, of course, as uh, companies, uh, the financial institutions, we need to invest on the machine learning, all these uh, uh, solutions. But on a country basis, 
we really need to uh, have some uh, digital solutions, some kind of invoice recording systems uh, to prevent uh, double invoicing, uh, double financing, or maybe validating the invoices if we received as a factoring company invoice, is it a real invoice or not? Maybe link with the governmental systems to uh, validate the invoices. So this kind of uh, uh, general information systems on a governmental level is also very important for the for the old financial institutions, for banks, for non-bank financial institutions. Every financial institution that having the invoice, that having the assignment, needs to verify, validate their invoices to prevent the fraud. Because as far as we are investing on fraud, so I, I can see that also Carol uh, uh, explained very good all these uh, developments because there are lots of opportunities to uh, have to having the benefit from the systems. The fraud uh, creators also learning that fast from the yeah. system. Yeah, but we have here also a question because I remember we discussed it last year, the question of the, um, if we have some details regarding factoring and contractual disputes along with the in, in fraud prevention and cross-border factoring. Do you have some like updated statistics here or? I remember we discussed it last year about the disputes between. Uh, yeah, but uh, the dispute is uh, what we are seeing uh, from the last year to this year, uh, there is a sharp decrease in the disputes uh, mm -hmm. because of the controlling systems, I think, uh, detects the disputes and uh, factoring is very flexible product. So communicating with the buyer, seller and the factory itself helps in, in this pandemic uh, for the last one year, what I see helps the uh, uh, financial institutions to, to solve the problems. Uh, so dispute is something that you can solve, but fraud is something totally different. Fraud is fraud. They're, they're, so we are facing uh, organized frauds, mm -hmm. uh, what I see from the market. Uh, the it is not possible for factoring companies uh, with the systems. It's uh, organized fraud, it's organized fraud, and we lost money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need is to come together with uh, like this uh, online meeting, maybe in the fraud seminars, to detect the, how they organize fraud. Uh, they are organizing these fraud cases because uh, it is in also, also domestically or internationally on the uh, trade finance sector, also commodity sector, uh, as we are not uh, having the uh, same uh, data. Uh, sometimes uh, one bank or the other bank or maybe 10 banks having the uh, same uh, oil or barrel of oil as a uh, collateral in uh, different countries. So it is uh, really difficult to detect the fraud. But mm -hmm. when I went to the uh, dispute, late payments, uh, from the FCI statistics, uh, it's almost uh, 10 to 15 percent decrease in the late payments especially in the, this five month period uh, by the end of May, uh, mm -hmm. even the uh, turnover decrease, especially in Europe, uh, we are seeing a very, very good uh, increase in the turnovers and the late payment amounts decrease sharply. So the market uh, seems that uh, works very properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have uh, another question on the fraud risk uh, from uh, uh, from Lev, are there any tools that you're familiar with and which are issued to manage the fraud risk for one off time transaction or are adapted for the invoice discounting product? Carol, do you have some here? Maybe some. Uh... To be honest, I think that the early warning system that I, I mentioned earlier uh, also responds that that situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe other things that the factors are are doing right now, if the invoice is, for example, one-time invoice that that they want to finance, the they will check it more properly. For example, they will confirm it with the contractor to be sure that that uh, this invoice really exists. That's that's what came of, of uh, to mind uh, for me right now. Mm -hmm. Because here, yes, we have a, a, a new comment. There's a changes. In the tool that you mentioned in the customer behavior do not only help to detect discrepancies when full flow is being financed 
uh, but does not feed as early warning signal for occasional invoices financed. Not... Could you comment this? Yeah, sorry, I need to read these questions. May I yes. add uh, yes. something to the previous one because this is okay. really important. Sorry about that. Uh, this is uh, what I see from, for example, in Turkish market, we have companies, they're doing very small uh, ticket size business. And usually the, uh, the business is not continuous. It's uh, just like uh, one-off time transactions. Uh, and they are fully working online uh, uh, with the digital solutions, uh, machine learning solution, artificial intelligence behind the decision. Uh, but what I hear from those uh, financial institutions, even they are they are fully working with the digital solutions. It's not possible with that small uh, ticket side business on a, a transact. But what I hear from that uh, companies, even they are working on the digital solutions, one-to-one -one personal contact with the sellers is also very important. You need to see the seller because you need to see the seller, understand their business, maybe in the first time, but you need to sell it. Fully online transactions is uh, very difficult to detect the uh, fraud. Uh, and uh, for the uh, invoice discounting product, if it is a continuous business, it, it is much more um, easy to uh, detect the fraud cases because uh, as Carol uh, explained, uh, you can detect the increase and decrease of the turnover, invoices, maybe a uh, price of the uh, one good or something. So it is uh, when you are doing uh, uh, invoice discounting product, the invoice itself explains and uh, explains lots of things uh, related to that uh, business. Yes, and to the counterparty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carl, would you add here? I think, I think that was told everything that, that everything that I that I wanted to add. So so I think that that's uh, everything I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let us uh, move maybe to a bit other topics. Yes, uh, Paolo, thank you. Uh, this is also the uh, a relevant very um, question. So how the pandemic and like the last uh, year maybe changed the cooperation between uh, factoring companies and insurance uh, companies. I think at uh, the beginning of the pandemic, um, not only banks uh, tightened their procedures for granting uh, uh, a limit, but also insurance companies uh, did it. Because, um, uh, and to be honest, it wasn't a surprise for me because uh, no one knew what these lockdowns will look like, how long they will last, etc. And I, as I remember, in 2020 in Poland, the recourse factoring was most were more was more popular than non-recourse factoring, which is yeah. a change of the situation because the previous year previous years the non-recourse factoring was more popular. But luckily, in the first quarter of 2021, as I saw the data from Poland, everything is back on the uh, right track right now, where mm -hmm. insurance companies and factors and banks cooperate uh, which, uh, which, uh, with each other on the bigger scale. And I'm glad uh, because for the uh, company that are using factoring uh, uh, as a product, I think the information from the insurance com company about the contractor, the counterparty, or uh, uh, getting rid of the risk of this contractor is a very, very uh, big issue. And if I had the uh, factoring as agreement, I think uh, I would like to have this agreement with cooperation with the insurance company because the safety, especially in pandemic and post-pandemic times is very important right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vito, would you add something? Yeah, we, in the beginning of pandemic, uh, of course, we follow very, very closely the statistics, that their expectation about the uh, bankruptcy ratios. Uh, different uh, insurance uh, companies, they announced their expectation and the expectation was really uh, shocked me because in uh, uh, different sectors uh, and the different countries, the expectations of the bankruptcies was like, uh, 25 percent, 45 percent, up to 50 percent. They they were expecting the bankruptcies. So, which is uh, you know, if uh, you see 50 percent bankruptcy in one country, 
So, I mean, it's very difficult for even the big bands, for non-bank financial institutions, it is, it's going to be horrible. But what happened, we see a very uh, a high level of governmental support in all the countries. So, uh, I think we didn't see the real performance of the insurance uh, companies because of this support. Mm -hmm. So, the mm -hmm. government support and continuous support uh, from the governmental level and also the maybe the um, the exim bank support uh, to the markets uh, we don't feel that the, the insurance uh, companies maybe let's call panic or credit cancellation on a huge level uh, so i think we passed this uh, part uh, last year and this year uh, quite frankly it's not uh, disturbed financial institutions but the expectation for the from uh, from today to maybe in three, two years' time, it is difficult because uh, we don't know how the governmental support will continue on this uh, yeah. uh, insurance policies, companies. So if there, there will be no governmental support, we don't know how the insurance uh, companies perform mm -hmm. uh, because our industry also working very closely, hand in hand with the insurance companies. So. Uh, what I see from the pandemic, the, our members perform very, very good, very good. And uh, we don't see any big problems uh, in between the factoring uh, companies, very few, and it's already uh, solved without arbitration. But as I see, it is, it is different. The, the, the last one and a half year was quite different uh, because of the economic support from the governments. Uh, so the real insurance companies' uh, perform, performance, I think we will see from then on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes, I can agree, of course. But, and I think the, it's also wor wor worth to mention one thing that the uh, help from the government must be returned in some some point. Yes, maybe not all the amount amount of the government help. And I think the companies need to remember and be secure of that. So, uh, as I saw some some information that the uh, government help. A little bit ruined the factoring market because the liquidity on the market was a little bit better thanks to this uh, government help. And I think the companies need to remember that that uh, the money will be returned at some point. So some, some of this money uh, will be returned. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I would like now also maybe to get back to the question of digitalization and Carol, question to you. So if, uh, because we see that there are um, tools on the market, you know, for everything, for the digital uh, onboarding, uh, KYC, digital signatures, uh, uh, everything. So, so if uh, a, a factoring company or a bank decides to digitalize a factoring process for micros and SMEs, let's say, so how long does it take from, from, from your perspective and, and um, how exactly banks cooperate with you? How long does it take? What team is needed from the bank side, uh, etc.? So, what is, what are the resources needed? <laughs> okay, this is very good questions, and uh, I think right now, thanks to the newest technology, it is possible to do do this in less than one month, maybe a few weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, we are able to provide the system right now into the production where the end clients, uh, so front office clients and the back office uh, employees at this case, can uh, use it in, in uh, five weeks. Of course, it depends on the scale of the business that new company wants to, to have. For example, if this is, if this is a market challenger, I've, so the company that uh, show, have seen the advantages of the factoring and start to think about it, I think it will be easy in one, uh, one month, uh, even less. Uh, mm -hmm. The biggest, uh, the bigger uh, factors, I I think maximum two months because I think the integrations there will be a little bit uh, there will be a little bit more integrations for example with accounting systems KYC systems etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think the one month is right now right now possibility mm -hmm. to have a, a digitized factoring a platform and system Mm -hmm. Wow, this is fast. <laughs> this, this is fast, really right? Fast. And this is, I think this is also the answer for, uh, thanks to the newest technology, the microservices, mm -hmm. as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, uh, helps uh, to develop the system uh, very, very fast. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have a question from Rainy. How SMEs react to the digitalization in your views? Would they still prefer banks despite all the benefits of the digitalization? Well, I, I can comment uh, from myself being an SME <laughs> in Poland. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think that for micros and for SME segment, this is uh, crucial, I mean, both for banks and for the customers to have this service, factoring service digitalized, because either micros and SMEs do not have time to go with paper documents uh, to the banks or factoring companies, because 80% of SMEs are sole entrepreneurs and they are everything in their business. So they really do not have time to, you know, to, to do these paper things. And the second thing is that for the banks and for the factoring company, this is not paid off to have manual processes for, for SME. That's why they do not mainly cover this segment. This is, uh, this is the main, uh, uh, the main um, problem now. And that these fintechs that are still, as I mentioned in my presentation, covering like one or 2% of the market, they are actually uh, targeting this micro segment, which is not covered uh, from the banks. Uh, and this also, I should, for example, mention here that this is also important and and have a um, very big impact if e-invoicing is obligatory in the country. So as soon as this month, I mean, I I here in the European Union, I think more or less in all the countries, this is obligatory. If not, they, it will be obligatory in the nearest years. So when you have an SME has, should have an invoice platform anyway, to issue to issue invoices, so and um, uh, and and uh, so so this is not you know the case of the paper invoice anymore. So this is the first step of eliminating this uh, paper invoice. And for the second, uh, I mean, this is really convenient. For example, um, you know, I can give you like my view here is that, for example, when somebody is calling me, I don't know, at nine in the morning. And asking me from factoring company, asking me whether I need factoring. You know, at night in the morning, I do not need factoring because you know I have my own issues uh, on my mind, and you know somebody calling me, I am not in the context of me something. But when I issue an invoice or check in my invoice, for example, you issued this month what is paid and what is not, and in this very moment, I may need a factoring. But you know, seeing that this invoice is, for example, not paid. Or I really need, for example, have some urgent payments, and I want to uh, finance this invoice right now at this very moment, not at night in the morning, but right now when I'm checking this. So, and this is the moment where it is time and it is in the context of the, you know, my business situation to offer me invoice. Because, for example, when I have invoicing, and more and more banks also now implementing for the business customers online accounting as well. This means that. Bank of, uh, like uh, and factoring companies can actually uh, uh, have also access, for example, to the transaction data due to the PSD2 and open banking opportunities uh, here in Europe, for example. Then such company has a lot of information on business, if not all. So and having this, like I would expect as an SME that this that I could I will be able to finance this invoice in one in one click and in one minute because they have bank have has all information from my side. They have all the invoices all my accounting documents and I would like to finance invoice here right now to make my next payment, for example. So this is, and this is, uh, I think this is the, the, and this is the, even now and maybe, uh, and maybe future that this is how it should be sold. So not, uh, I mean. Yes, and I think I can add one thing. Yes. <laughs> yes, sorry to interrupt you. Yes, uh, yeah. I, I can add one thing. The, over 10 years ago, when I started to work in company, in factoring company, uh, if the client wanted to purchase the invoice for financing, she, the client need to go to the bank, show me the original invoice. I need to scan this original invoice, send it to the operations in the uh, in the central, and uh, and it took time. So that's why the the uh, financing wasn't one hour after the, the purchasing invoice to the system, for example, it took two days, right? These times will never happen again because the younger and the younger generation, as, as I mentioned before, want to have something, everything fast online without going to the bank. So going to the bank in a few years, I think it will only be, uh, to be honest, uh, from my perspective, I don't want to come to the bank. Sorry for <laughs> showing this, yeah, but I'm that yeah. client. I'm that client that do not want to go to the bank. 
I'm mad if I want if I have to go to the bank. I want to do everything online. Yes, yes. And whether and actually we to coming back to the question and whether this a bank or some other provider actually doesn't matter because for example, I'm clicking the invoice and it better maybe would not be called as factoring, just I don't know, sell the invoice or finance the invoice or something. So, you know, I click, for example, it calculates me how much does it cost for me. And actually, I don't care who is the provider. I need it for one exactly. click, for example, and for one minute. So this is, I think this is the, the, the what should be done for at and least micro and SMEs. For large corporate, this could be another situation. But for but the micros, yes. I think it will be done, Olena. I think it will be done. <laughs> I yes, think I'm for this. <laughs> From from my own experience, before the pandemic, it is difficult because the SMEs normally uh, they don't want them to change the way of their funding, even if it is not digitized, even if it is uh, maybe costly, even if it is maybe not online. But usually the SMEs are quite uh, not familiar with this kind of solutions. They don't want to change their way of behavior, uh, and uh, sometimes. Uh, Mostly they have a language problem because what I see, for example, in Turkey, uh, we have many SMEs, uh, they are uh, producing for the big retailers and they are having uh, many solutions, online solutions with a better pricing. But this is very difficult. It was very difficult to convince them to uh, upload their invoices to a platform that they, they do not know. But I mm -hmm. think pandemic changed everything because we don't uh, even we don't have this knowledge of uh, being online to talk everything uh, on a uh, online basis. So it's just, it's changed everything and it will convince people uh, to do everything without going to a bank or spending so much time spending money on it. Uh, so now today, what I see on the SME side, they are very very digitized also. It, they have to be because even you, you digitize all your process, e-solutions, e-signature. If the client do not have the e-solution and the e-signature, e it doesn't work. I mean, it's not on one side. Yeah. We need to be, yeah. uh, they to be up, updated uh, their uh, uh, e-solution uh, procedures in their companies. Yes, it should be like pushed by the government as well. So as soon, for example, as e invoicing becoming obligatory, there is no other way that, you know, they issue it for paper and there is no need to scan. So they just, you know, enter any platform and they should issue the invoice. And then it becomes simple. When near this invoice, they see the button, finance, or I don't know, sell, sell this invoice, this becoming simpler yeah, because, of course, when you should scan, open something, yes, this is a bit difficult already. Yes, we have a question about um, SaaS model. Does bank prefer this model? And uh, another continuation of the question, uh, general, this model generally have multi-tenancy involved. Still, do you think banks prefer this model or only small new factoring company prefer this model to reduce their capital uh, expenditure? Carol, this is a question to you. Yes, yes, as I think uh, right now about this question, uh, I think the smaller uh, factors and the market challengers are the perfect clients for the uh, software as a service uh, model because, for example, they don't need to wor worry about the, all the security issues. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they don't have to... Uh, they don't have to uh, have an employee that are IT specialists right now, which is also a very, very uh, costly, costly employee right now. They don't have to uh, worry about all the servers, uh, about the infrastructure. So uh, in my opinion, right now, the smaller factors and the game challengers are, the, are, are asking only, only for the SaaS model right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. They don't want the traditional on-premise model, but the SaaS model. Mm -hmm. Okay, and as we are coming close uh, to to the end of our webinar, so let us answer the last uh, question here from Remy: Which markets are more reluctant to digitalization, in your opinion, if there is any? Well, I uh, 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 can comment from 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 our side. So, what we see so the level of digitalization depends on several factors. Uh, so first of all, this is the number of SMEs uh, in the country. I think this is one of the uh, big pushes when banks and other financial companies are 
So the bigger the market, the more interest in investment in digital solutions for this market uh, and uh, have like an advantage in this. So this is the first and that's why, for example, here Poland uh, in the Central uh, Europe region is one of the leaders because this is really the biggest number of SMEs, which is uh, around 2 million SMEs, active SMEs um, in the country. Uh, uh, the second is actually the support of uh, governmental, uh, of government, let's say. So uh, the ex existence uh, um, of the, for example, Ministry of Digitalization or some other governmental or uh, bodies that uh, uh, help push, promote, and due to the and with the regulations uh, push actually to the digital solutions, which, for example, we mentioned e invoicing here. So this is not, when this is becoming uh, not nice to have, not a business case, but uh, you know, uh, obligatory uh, and compliance case. This changed the picture very, very greatly. So this is you know this is this is this is my uh, feeling at what I see in the market. So Bitul and Karo, please also comment here. Yeah, um, I am responsible for Central Eastern Europe, South Eastern Europe, and the Middle East, and I am work, uh, working more than uh, 30, 40 countries. I don't see any country that they are uh, reluctant to uh, digitalization. Mm -hmm. Every company, banks, and the governmental level, uh, we are organizing many events with the investment banks, uh, with EBRD, IFC, World Bank, uh, so to support the country's infrastructure law, so it's uh, they're all very very keen to increase their infrastructure for digitalization. Uh, so I think it is an it's it's a new era. It's really uh, I, I I can see that these developments on the on the governmental level. So they all want to invest because uh, on the average minimum eighty percent of our economy is depending on the SMEs. So, so we need this. We need to build these systems. It is unavoidable. We need to build these systems, and the financial institutions need to uh, upgrade their systems uh, to serve these uh, SMEs, because it's also they are they are serving our economies, and they are also creating the um, employment of the all the countries. These are uh, very crucial. Uh, of course, we are talking about digitalization of the financial institutions. It is quite minor, but on the uh, uh, macro view, uh, we need to solve the issue of the SMEs funding, uh, employment, green financing. So this this is this is unavoidable. So so they are all spending time, effort, money mm -hmm. to solve this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Carl. And you. Yes, I think this process of digitalization started a few years ago, and I think it will uh, last uh, for a couple of years uh, in the future. And I think that's good because the, as I mentioned, the uh, younger and the younger uh, people will want to have all all things digitalized, all things in the phone because yeah. they don't want to go to the banks. And I think uh, the banks see that opportunity because if they do not digital, uh, digitize their process, for example, the speed of granting limits, they will lose on the market yes? because they will be other provider that can can uh, have the decision in less than one, uh, one day, uh, in 10 seconds, exactly, in 10 seconds. So I think that's the future of, of banking, uh, uh, online process without, without leaving home. Yeah. Okay, so hope to see more and more digitalization here in the region in the these and upcoming years. Thank you very much, Karen and Petu, for your contribution today. Thank you all attendees for staying, uh, for being active and for staying to the very end. So thank you very much and see you next time online. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for the participants. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.